scripture verse by verse, but another aspect of my ministry and that for which I suppose I'm most well known is this seminar titled Clouds Without Water. And Clouds Without Water is a reference in the book of Jude, verse 12. Jude refers to false teachers in a number of different ways. He says they are hidden reefs in your love feasts. They feast with you without fear, caring only for themselves. And then he says that they are clouds without water. And so the picture there that Jude draws for us of false teachers is that false teachers have the appearance of having some nourishment, but no sustenance ever falls from them. They leave the ground below them dry and parched. And my seminar, Clouds Without Water, deals specifically with what is known as the Word of Faith movement. Uh, that is the proper term given to a movement that's more commonly known as the health and wealth gospel, the name it and claim it gospel, the prosperity gospel, basically the doctrine that says it is always God's will for a Christian to be wealthy, it's always God's will for a Christian to be physically healed, you should never be sick, or if you do get sick, then physical healing is guaranteed, provided that you have enough faith. And this movement is led by people such as Benny Hinn, Kenneth Copeland, Joyce Meyer, Creflo Dollar, Jesse Duplantis, Andrew Womack, Joseph Prince, Joel Osteen, Todd White. Undoubtedly, you know at least some of these names. And so we'll be looking at that. We'll also be looking at a movement called the New Apostolic Reformation, NAR. And NAR is a twin movement to the Word Faith Movement. It's basically everything that the Word Faith Movement is, even worse. It has an even greater emphasis on modern day apostles, signs and wonders. And they're basically, Word of Faith and NAR now are basically just melding into the same thing. The only real difference between them would be primarily in the eschatology, whereas most Word of Faith would be, generally speaking, premillennial. Uh, most NA, or well, all NAR would be hyper postmillennial, um, getting into dominion theology and all that kind of stuff. So, so uh, there's there's a few differences, but there's not. I mean, a few distinctions, but not really a lot of differences. There kind of melding into the same. With NAR you would have primarily the, the titular head of it would be Bill Johnson. Bill Johnson, the pastor of Bethel Church in Redding, California that puts out Bethel music and all that kind of stuff. So, so I'll be treating this, these movements as one and the same because for all intents and purposes they are. So Kenneth Copeland would be like at the, you know, the, one of the grand poobahs of the Word Faith movement. Bill Johnson, Grand Poobah of New Apostolic Reformation, and they're friends with each other. They endorse each other, speak at each other's churches, so they're basically one of the same. So um, this session is entitled Dangerous Doctrines, and I want us to look at the doctrines of the Word Faith NAR movement. Let me give you just a brief, brief overview of the history of the movement, though, because it helps to understand a movement if you have at least kind of a working knowledge of the history of the movement. John Alexander Dowie, where does he do his shopping? Uh, he, was, he was born in Scotland, moved to Australia, developed an interest in faith healing in the 1880s, moved to the United States. He formed the International Divine Healing Association in San Francisco. He prayed for the healing only of paid members of his own cult is what it was. So quite literally a pay to pray situation. If you did not give him your money, no prayers for you. He formed the Zion Tabernacle in Chicago, founded the city of Zion, which banned all practice of medicine. He spoke strongly against doctors, telling his followers to rely solely upon their faith. And there is this, this strong anti-medicine undercurrent in the word faith movement from its inception and it remains there to this day because one of the fundamental tenets of the word faith movement is that it is always God's will for you to be healed and you will be healed as long as you have enough faith. Well, what better way to show that you don't really have faith than to what? Than to go see your doctor or to take your medicine if you get sick because if you go see your doctor 
you take your medicine, then what you're saying is, I don't really believe that God is going to heal me. And that, in the Word Faith Movement, that is the fastest way to lose your miracle of healing. He started healing rooms. Bethel Church in Redding, California is known for having healing rooms. Well, these were begun by John Alexander Dowie. He lived in opulent luxury. Uh, he exploited the people that followed him. Many people died under his quote-unquote care, including a number of children. And he's the forerunner of the American Pentecostal movement. He's the one that kind of first began the Pentecostal movement. And he also claimed to be a reincarnation of Elijah. Charles Fox Parham, this is one of the great generals of the charismatic movement. The charismatic movement has some men and some women in their history that they refer to as God's generals. And they just revere these people. John Alexander Dowie was one. Charles Fox Parham is another. Charles Fox Parham was fascinated with a, another charlatan. For time's sake, I won't go into him, but a guy named Frank Sanford. Uh, but he is widely regarded as the father of the American Pentecostal movement. He taught that the Old Testament character Job suffered because he was living in sin. That's the reason all these calamities fell upon Job. He was living in sin. And that is a, a common teaching in the Word Faith movement to this day. He founded the Bethel Healing School and School of Prophecy. Might sound familiar to you. Uh, he taught that preachers who do not preach, quote, the gospel of healing will face utter condemnation before God. According to Parham, healing was just as much a part of the gospel as was being forgiven of sin. And if you don't preach healing, well, then you will die and go to hell. He derided Christians for going to doctors, just like John Alexander Dowie. He had a couple of different scams that, I mean, the guy was a complete charlatan. He had this Ark of the Covenant scam. He claimed to have a document that detailed the precise location of the Ark of the Covenant. And so he raised money from all of his followers to fund this trip to go over to the Holy Land, to Israel, to find the Ark of the Covenant. So he raised all this money, took people's monies, but of course he never found the Ark of the Covenant. Indiana Jones found the Ark of the Covenant. <laughs> he had another scam. He claimed to have a device that would turn rocks into gold. And you could have your rocks turned into gold if you would just, of course, give him your money and so he could build this machine. But he assured you that once it was built, of course, it would work. Uh, he was arrested for sodomy back when such things were actually illegal in this country. Uh, of course, now they're celebrated and shoved in our faces all the time. But he was, uh, he was a homosexual. He was a homosexual. And like John Alexander Dowie, he also claimed to be Elijah. Um, for time's sake here, I'm going to skip a few of these. Catherine Kuhlman. Some of you more seasoned saints might remember Catherine Kuhlman. Let me uh, watch this video clip of Catherine Kuhlman. The church is precious. Oh, if you only knew how precious is the church. How precious is the bride of Christ. How precious is the bride of Christ. It's the Father's gift to His Son. You can't love without giving. You can. The greatest gift that is possible for Him to give. He shall receive. Just in case you've been sleeping a little too well at night, I wanted, to, <laughs> I wanted to show you that so it could haunt your dreams. Uh, Catherine Kuhlman was the world's most famous female faith healer. Uh, she was a big deal back in the 50s, 40s, 50s, 60s, and 70s. 
Uh, Benny Hinn was fascinated by Catherine Kuhlman. He never met her in person, but he went to several of her crusades, and he was just fascinated by her. And when you look at old clips of Catherine Kuhlman and modern clips of Benny Hinn, they're basically the same person. He aped a lot of her mannerisms, uh, techniques. She wore a white dress. He wears a white suit. So, um, yeah. And Benny Hinn actually claimed that Catherine Kuhlman showed up to him from the dead, paid a visit to him from beyond the grave. In 1933, she settled in Denver and uh, started the Denver Revival Tabernacle and was the pastor of that movement. Of course, if you have a church with a female pastor, you have neither a pastor nor do you have a church. She pastored another church in Pennsylvania and invited a guy named Burroughs Waltrip to come preach at her church. Uh, Burroughs Waltrip, however, was a married man with children but he proceeded to leave his wife and kids and married Catherine Kuhlman. So she was a homewrecker. She was an adulteress. Of course, Burroughs Walter, an adulterer. Their marriage only lasted seven years. Uh, she later, oddly, denied that she ever got married to Burroughs Walter. She was asked about it by a reporter, and she said, no, we, act we, we thought about getting married, but we never did. She said, I passed out before we took the wedding vows, this despite there being an actual marriage certificate and license on file at the courthouse, yes, they did get married. I mean, she was just, she was a con artist. Uh, Charles Fox Parham was a con artist. John Alexander Daly was a con, con artist. Uh, all of these people were. Uh, John G. Lake, John G. Lake is one of the most revered of the charismatic generals. He was a disciple of John Alexander Dowie, founded the church at Portland, Oregon. Charismatics today claim that he healed over 100,000 people. None of these healings, however, are documented. The only kind of healings that happen in the charismatic movement are psychosomatic healings, mind over body. And there's any number of conditions that you can get temporary relief from just through a temporary rush of adrenaline, rush of endorphins, you think you, you're expecting a miracle, okay? You're expecting it, and you, in the heat of the moment, in the excitement of the moment, I mean, you've got all these other people, thousands of people usually gathered around you, you begin to convince yourself that you do, that you feel better, and you know what? For a, a little while, you actually do feel better until the euphoria subsides, a new day dawns, and the symptoms always reappear. Psychosomatic healings happen all the time in the charismatic movement. What you don't find in the charismatic movement are organic healings, true healings that cannot be explained just through a temporary rush of adrenaline, an amputee growing a new limb, someone who was born blind with instant 20-20 vision, Someone who has uh, something like what I've got, cerebral palsy. You know, if I'm, if I'm standing up on my crutches, no matter how happy I'm in, I may be, no matter how good of a mood I'm in, <laughs> you take my crutches away from me, boom, you know, down goes Frazier. <laughs> that would be an organic healing, okay? Those kind of healings never happen in the charismatic movement. They're always psychosomatic. All of his were psychosomatic healings. Newspaper reports of the day roundly debunked his claims. His own wife died of a fever six months after they arrived in South Africa. So he healed 100,000 people, yet he couldn't heal his own wife. He later got engaged to a gal, his, his fiance. She also died of malaria. Interestingly, he only... He could only marry this woman and get engaged to her because he got permission to marry her from his late wife, his dead wife. And he got in touch with her through a seance. He talked to dead people. He faced criminal charges for fraud uh, as a scam artist. He had an affair with a 17-year-old girl from South Africa who moved to the United States to be with him. I mean, he was a complete, just a complete fraud. And 
and he also claimed to be Elijah. A lot of Elijah. William Branham also, for time's sake, I, I won't go into, but uh, he was anti-Trinitarian. He also claimed to be uh, Elijah. So all of these people, they all claim to be, will the real Elijah please stand up? <laughs> so all of the generals, God's generals of the charismatic movement were frauds. They were frauds. They were theological heretics. They were scam artists. And most, if not all of them, were sexually immoral. That's the entire history of the charismatic movement. More modern day, Oral Roberts, uh, along with Benny Hinn, the most famous faith healer, Kenneth Hagin, the father of the modern word faith movement, and then Kenneth Copeland, who began his career as the pilot for Kenneth Hagin. And Kenneth Copeland, we'll see some video of him, he is one of the darkest individuals that I've ever come across. I really believe, without any hyperbole, I truly believe that Kenneth Copeland is demon-possessed. I really do. He has uttered some of the most blood-curdling blasphemies you could ever imagine. And quite honestly, if you watch the guy, there's something about his eyes. There's something about the guy's eyes. Very, very dark. Okay, so now let us look at the doctrines of the word faith movement. We'll begin by looking at the doctrine of positive confession, the belief that we can speak things into existence. Uh, watch this from Levi Lusco up in Kalispell, Montana. I want you to know that when God made you, made you in His image, the image of a creator who created by speaking. He said, let there be light, and there was. He said, let there be an earth, he let, let there be dolphins, and there were because he spoke them. He's a creative God who spoke these things into existence, and then he made you in his image. So you were created by a creator to create. And one of the chief ways you create is by participating with God in creation through speaking. The Bible echoes from the Old to the New Testament that life and death are caught up in the power of the tongue. So every single time you speak, there's an act of creation. When you speak, there is an act of creation. They teach that we can speak things into existence just like God did. Unless you think I am uh, taking them out of context, this is tweet from Creflo Dollar, undoubtedly the most aptly named of the prosperity preachers, but he says, as spiritual beings who possess the nature of God, we have the ability to speak things into existence just like God did. So yes, they do teach this, that we can literally create out of nothing with our mouths, with the words that we speak. Dear friends, that is something that only God can do. That is something that only God can do. God spoke things into existence out of nothing. That is an ability that only he has. The faith preachers and the New Apostolic Reformation movement, they blur that line between God the Creator and us his created. They demote God, and then in turn, they deify man. Watch this from Gloria Copeland. How powerful are our words? Well, so powerful that uh, if you don't like the weather, then you can just change it. You know, you're, the, you're supposed to control the weather. I mean, Ken's the primary weatherman at our house, but when he's not there, I do it. He can see what's happening out there. It shows just like they have on at the weather, like on the news. I mean, he's got the computers, got the current weather on it and all that for flying. So uh, sometimes I'll hear something. I'll hear the thunder start. Maybe he'll still be asleep. And I'll say, Ken, you need to do something about this. <laughs> and knowing that. But you are the one that has authority over the weather. One day, Ken and Pat Boone, well, we were in Hawaii at their house, and we were, they were sitting outside, and there was a weather spout out over the ocean. And that's like a tornado, except it hits the water. 
And so they were sitting there, and they just watched it, rebuked it. It never did anything. One day, I was in the airplane in the back, and my little brother was in the back with me, and Ken was up front flying. And we were not in the weather because we don't fly bad weather. But we, we could see the weather over here. And I looked out the window, and that tornado came down just like this, down toward the ground. And Ken said, I rebuke you in the name of Jesus. You get back up there. So this is how I learned how to talk to tornadoes. I saw this. And that tornado went, woo, 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 woo. Even while I was watching him, my little brother was not a devout Christian at that time, and that was really good for him to see. So you're the weatherman. You get out there, or the weather woman, whichever it is, and you talk to that thing, and you tell it, you're not coming here. I command you to dissipate, and you get back up there in Jesus' name. Glory to God. That, that, I won't charge you extra. <laughs> that, is, that is so obviously absurd, and it really doesn't even need or deserve a comment, but if you'll indulge me, did you notice how she says, we can control the weather, but we don't fly in bad weather. <laughs> Why not? I mean, if you can control the weather, fly through whatever you want to fly through. Just talk to it before you get there, you know. And aside from the theology, aside from the theology, just a little common sense goes a long way in clearing a lot of this stuff up. Just a little common sense. But uh, this is not a one-off. The, the faith preachers claim to be able to control the weather. Kenneth Copeland does. Uh, Joyce Meyer claims to be able to do it. Jesse Duplantis claims to be able to do it. Uh, but it's particularly interesting coming from the Copelands because you might remember, I know you all remember, a couple of years ago, had remember this, the big freeze of 2021? Remember how cold it got here two years ago? Well... Kenneth Copeland is located just north of Fort Worth. It got cold where he was, too. In fact, did a lot of damage to his compound. Watch this. Why don't we do this? Let's show, show them the video. The video. This, this video, it's a short video, uh, and it's, it was reported by our head of maintenance and construction, Ethan Cerrone. What a tremendous man of God. He, he is, and what a job that those guys did. But it'll give you a picture of what took place on the campus. So guys, if we could roll that video, and then we'll finish this up. I'm Ethan Cerrone, Director of Facilities here at Kenneth Copeland Ministries. You're probably already aware of the extreme weather event that hit Texas in mid-February. And if you've been watching Eagle Mountain International Church, you're aware of some of the damage that occurred to the property and the equipment here on campus. While the impact was significant, we want you to know that faith never stops, and neither will we. Across campus, many cooling towers froze. EMIC, KCBC, headquarters, multiple buildings had damage to the heating and cooling system. Also in the headquarters building, we took damage from the sprinkler system. Our sprinkler heads froze, pipes froze, causing water flooding on all three levels. That extensive damage, we have not started to fix yet. One of our TV buildings, Revival Radio, a pipe burst in the ceiling above the green room, causing flooding in that room and extensive damage. We were able to stop it from getting into the actual TV studio area where we do our shooting. Now, thankfully, the ministry has insurance that will cover some of the costs. But as many of you have experienced, after paying the deductible, insurance still takes some time and doesn't always cover everything. So hundreds of thousands of dollars of damage to Kenneth Copeland's compound from this bitterly cold mass of Arctic air that settled over North Texas two years ago. Uh, and their insurance, you know, pays for most of it, but not all of it, so they're going to get the rest of it from you. <laughs> Kenneth Copeland brags about being a billionaire with a B, billionaire. He could pay for it himself out of his own pocket. It's lunch money for Kenneth Copeland. But oh no, he'd rather get it from you. I thought he could control the weather. <laughs> Why didn't he just raise the temperature a little bit? These people are such liars. They are such liars. This from John Hagee. 
A lot of people don't think he's word of faith, but he absolutely is. I believe that when a person says, I wish I were dead, he or she invites the spirit of death to invade his or her life. When an unhappy wife says, my marriage is a failure, she has pronounced the doom of this relationship. When a pregnant mother says, I don't want this baby, she is pronouncing the termination of her pregnancy or a curse upon the life of a child yet to be born. Speech is that powerful. Is it really? So according to John Hagee, if a pregnant woman, for whatever reason, simply verbalizes the words, I don't want this baby, she can actually kill her baby in her womb just by the words that she speaks. Where is the sovereignty of God in all of this? Where is the sovereignty of God? They have no concept of God's sovereignty. None. The God of the prosperity gospel, little g God, is a very weak, very indecisive, very effeminate God. And it is not the God of the Bible. Speaking things into existence, doing things that only God can do, leads us into our next doctrine, the little God's doctrine. All of the faith preachers teach that if you are a Christian, you are in fact a little God. Watch this from Creflo Dollar. Now, in verse 26 and verse 27, God now submits himself to this principle of everything producing after its own kind. And in verse 26 and 27, let's read it out loud. Ready? Read. And God said, let us make man in our image after our likeness and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the fowl of the air and over the cattle and over all the earth and over every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth so God created man in his own image, in the image of God created he him, male and female created he them. Now that's interesting because if everything produces after its own kind, we now see God producing man. And if God now produces man, and everything produces after its own kind. If horses get together, they produce what? And if dogs get together, they produce what? If cats get together, they produce what? But if the Godhead gets together and say, let us make man, then what are they producing? They're producing gods. Now, I got to hit this thing real hard in the very beginning because I ain't got time to go through all this, but I'm going to say to you right now, you are gods, little g. You are gods because you came from God and you are gods. You're not just human. The only human part about you is this physical body that you live in. The real me is just like God. The real me is just like God. Blasphemy. Blasphemy. Dear friends, when the Bible says that God created man in his image, that means that as human beings, you and I are the pinnacle of God's creation. We are the pinnacle of his creation. And we have a, the potential, the capacity, through a saving relationship with Jesus Christ, to know God. None of the other created order has that privilege and ability. Look, I like dogs. I do. Uh, I love dogs as much as the next guy grew up with dogs. Um, I have a dog now. Kathy got me a dog for Christmas a few years ago. She, she didn't want a dog at all, and I wanted a big, you know, like German Shepherd, Black Lab, or something like that. So she compromised, and she got me what is technically a dog. <laughs> little 10 pound, you know, frou-frou dog <laughs> with a little bow in her hair. <laughs> but she is a dog. And, you know, any, any man can have a big old lab or German shirt. It takes a real man to have a dog like my dog. <laughs> 
so, and you know, I've come to love the socks off that little thing. But Mia is her name. Mia is not created in God's image. She will never know God. We are. We share in what theologians sometimes refer to as the communicable attributes of God. We can know God through a saving relationship with Jesus Christ, but that does not mean that we are gods. The Bible is very clear. There is only one God, and he is a jealous God who will not share his glory with another. But this is not a one-off. This is actually a staple doctrine of the word faith movement. I want to show you two clips from Kenneth Copeland, one from the late 1980s, and then another one from just a couple of years ago. And I'm going to show you these two different clips, you know, with 30 plus years between, 40 years between them, to show you that uh, Kenneth Copeland has not changed, Word of Faith theology has not changed. Watch this. Kenneth Copeland from the late 1980s. And I say this with all respect, so that it don't upset you too bad, but I say it anyway. When I read in the Bible where he says, I am, I just smile and say, yes, I am too. Amen. When I read in the Bible where he says, I am, I just smile and I say, I am too. Unbelievable. This from Kenneth Copeland from two years ago. Let this mind be in you. Let this be the way you think. Let this mind be in you, which was also in the anointed Jesus, who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God. And you do not think it robbery. You don't, it, it's not taking anything away from God. Right. To be equal with our Father. To be equal with our Lord Jesus. He's the one that caused it to happen. And our good God said, oh yeah, they're my children. Of course they're equal to me. I gave birth to them. Of course they're equal to me equal. The word faith movement has gotten so bad now, it's pretty much dropped the little from the little God's doctrine. We're just gods. We're gods. Watch this from Stephen Furtick. Now, a lot of people don't think Stephen Furtick is word of faith. And on paper, well, to like two weeks ago, uh, he's Southern Baptist. Southern Baptist. Watch this from Stephen Furtick from 2021. I'm not in covenant with a person. I'm not in covenant with a political party. I'm in covenant with God Almighty. I am God Almighty. I am God Almighty. Now, when that clip first came out, uh, people were shocked by it, rightly so. But... Some others are saying, okay, now to be fair, you know, he didn't really mean he is God Almighty. That was just a slip of the tongue, uh, inarticulate moment, you know, kind of a, a Joe Biden moment. You know, it just wasn't, <laughs> wasn't real. And, and when I saw it, I, was, I actually thought the same thing. I mean, I've been calling Stephen Furtick a false teacher for a long time. But I, even I said, okay, I don't, I, I just, that was just a slip of the tongue. I thought that until I saw this clip of Stephen Furtick from two years before in which he said practically the same thing. Watch. God said, let us make man in our image, in our likeness. You are not my maker. You will not be my mirror. When God said, I am to Moses, you know, my name is I am. He was trying to get him to see you are as I am. Said the same thing two years before. So I actually think he did mean it. 
unbelievable. Stephen Furtick is an absolute wolf. An absolute wolf. Watch this from Jesse Duplantis. So when you understand, then you'll understand the book of Isaiah chapter 9. I want to read verse 6. For unto us, Isaiah 9 verse 6, For unto us a child is born. Unto us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulders, and his name shall be called Wonderful, Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. Yet the book of Ephesians chapter 5 verse 1 says, Be ye therefore imitators of God as dear children. So when I look at Isaiah 9, 6, where is the government now? It's on us. The government of the world is on mankind. And because we're made in God's image and in God's likeness, you can call us wonderful. Counselor. Mighty God, Christ in us. The everlasting Father. Woo! The Prince of Peace. That's what it means to be the gift. Jesse Duplantis actually makes himself the subject of Isaiah chapter 9. Unbelievable. Absolutely unbelievable. As I said, they've pretty much dropped the little from the little God's doctrine. Yeah, well... Yeah, the reason he's wearing a bow is he, he, uh, he's trying to say that the sermon is about uh, Jesus presenting us as gifts to the Father. And so he puts this bow on himself to make himself look like a present. But he's got that backwards. The Father presents us. The Father gave us to Christ as gifts from before the foundation of the world. So he doesn't even get that right. He's got a theological IQ below freezing. <laughs> Watch this from Michael Todd. Michael Todd, he's had a meteoric rise in popularity in just the last few years. Pastors in Tulsa, Oklahoma, watch this. You've just been taught wrong. It's one God. Everybody say one God. Say it like you mean it. One God, three expressions. Okay. Okay, I want to pause it right there. One God, three expressions. That's modalism, all right? The Trinity is one God in three persons, not three expressions, not three manifestations. That's a heresy known as modalism, that, that God basically changes modes. Sometimes he has on his father hat, then he takes the father hat off, puts on the son hat, then he takes off the son hat, puts on the Holy Spirit hat. He just changes modes. That's modalism, that's a heresy. Uh, but it is actually exactly what T.D. Jakes believes. Uh, you can go to his website right now if you want to and check it. He's, in their doctrinal statement, he says, We believe in one God in three manifestations. Not persons, manifestations. That's heresy. That is a different God than the God of the Bible. But anyway, we'll let Michael Todd continue. He's going to give us an illustration of the Trinity. Watch this. Let me, okay. What is this? It's water. That, 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 that's, that's what we say, but if you want to be very scientific, this is H2O. Okay? This is H2O. Let me ask you a different question. What, hold on real quick. We established this is what? It's H2O. What is this? You say ice? If we go down to its basic form, this is H2O. Now it's in a different form than the liquid version, but this still is. Uh huh. This is a different expression. What is this? This is H2O2. It's dry ice. 
and it's a different expression. So if that was God the Father, God the Son, this is God the Holy Spirit. Still H2O, but it takes on a completely different form. Oh, and this is what God is about to do in your life. You're about to see evidence. Not, not to get nitpicky here, but difference dry ice is not H2O. <laughs> dry ice is CO2, not H2O. But he's so enthusiastic about his hair. <laughs> difference, what you just saw illustrated there is modalism. That's an example of modalism not Trinitarianism. There is nothing that you can compare God to. Water, ice, and <laughs> dry ice, CO2. <laughs> These things don't coexist all at the same time. It, it's it's a horrible illustration of the Trinity. In fact, Isaiah 40 verse 25, this is God speaking. God says, to whom then will you liken me that I would be his equal, says the Holy One. Dear friends, this is not a challenge. This is not saying, okay, I want you to try to come up with an analogy to explain my triune nature. No. There is no thing, there is no one to whom you can compare God. That's the point. There is no one that you can compare him to, that, that person or that thing would be his equal. So please, uh, please do away with all of the Trinity analogies. God's not like water. He's not like an apple. You've seen that one maybe. Or like an egg. God's like an egg. You know, you got the yellow and you got the white and you got the shell, and, but it's one egg. You know, he's like a three-leaf clover. Uh, you know, he's like, a, he's like a person. He's like a man. You know, I'm a husband. Uh, but I'm also a father and I'm a brother, you know, and so I have all these different roles, but I'm just one person. Yeah. No, stop with the analogies of the Trinity. And please, for anyone, any of you who might teach vacation Bible school, please don't use these stupid analogies of the Trinity. None of them work. That's the point. There is no one, there is no thing that you can compare God to. That's the point. They demote God. They make little of God. I want us to look at what the faith preachers teach about the doctrine of the fall. And this will help us to understand why they teach what they teach. Number one, they hold that Adam was an exact duplicate of God. He was not a little like God. He was not a lot like God. They teach that Adam was literally an exact duplicate, a carbon copy of Yahweh. Well, we all know what happened, right? Adam sinned. Well, if Adam was Yahweh and he sinned, was it Yahweh who sinned? You see, you carry these doctrines out to their logical conclusion and you see how heretical they really are. But when Adam sinned, he lost his godhood, lost his deity, transferred it to Satan, and when this happened, the real Yahweh God lost his legal right to planet Earth and was kicked out. And so, as we sit here this morning, according to classic word faith theology, God is up there somewhere, but he's got no access to planet Earth. He's illegal in his own creation. Well, someone has to fill that void, right? And so... Satan is all too eager to step up to the plate, and Satan becomes the legal god of planet Earth. Dear friends, Satan is not the legal god of planet Earth. God is the legal god of planet Earth. The Earth is the Lord's, the fullness thereof, the world and they that dwell therein. God is the legal god of planet Earth, not Satan. Satan is referred to in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 4, as the god of this age. But Paul was making a theological point, not a legal point. Paul was saying that this world is so fallen, so sinful, so depraved, 
that it follows after Satan as if he were the God of this age, not the legal God of planet Earth. Well, guess what happens when a person gets saved? According to Word Faith in AR Theology, guess what you get back? Ah, oh, you get your Godhood back. You regain your deity. You become God again, just like Adam supposedly was before he fell. And this, dear friends, is why the faith preachers hold so tenaciously to health and wealth, because we're gods. And a God cannot be poor, and a God certainly cannot be sick. So many people think that this movement is just about health and wealth and, you know, prosperity, Rolex watches, private jets, healing, that kind of stuff. No, that's just some of the bad, low-hanging fruit off of a rotten theological tree, a tree that is rotten and dead at its core. But the allure of health and wealth is one of the things that makes this movement so appealing and yet so dangerous at the same time. Because the prosperity gospel says, come to Jesus because he'll make you rich and he'll heal your body. They appeal to two of the most basic and universal of all human desires. Most people would like to be wealthy. And hardly anyone enjoys being sick. And there's a few people out there that just like the attention that comes with being sick. But most of us, if we had our druthers right, we'd rather not be sick. And so the prosperity gospel says, well, if you'll just come to Jesus, if you'll just ask Jesus into your heart to use that lingo, then you can have it. You'll be rich, never be sick again. Well, wait a minute, so you're telling me that if I, if I become a Christian, <laughs> that God's gonna make me a multimillionaire and I'll never be sick again. Sign me up, man. You know, I, I like that, Jesus. You got two of them, I'll, I'll take them both. But is that the real gospel? Or is the real gospel something a little bit more like this? Come to Jesus because you're a sinner? Because you deserve nothing but the wrath of God? And the full undiluted fury of God's wrath will be poured out on you if you do not repent of sin and turn, your, turn from sin and place your faith in Christ. And if you will do that, if you will turn from sin, place your trust in Christ, then... You will have heaven. The wrath of God will be removed. You will have heaven. But on this earth, we're not promised money. We're not promised healing. What are we promised? We're promised persecution. That's what we're promised. What does the Bible say? Some of those who live godly in Christ Jesus may be persecuted. Is that what it says? All who live godly in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. Hmm. That, that's not as popular, you see. It's saying, come to Jesus because you can be rich. You'll never be sick again. Friends, if you come to Jesus for those reasons, you've come for the wrong reasons. You have trusted a false Jesus and a false gospel. And a different Jesus does not save. Does not save. The gospel, the prosperity gospel is about self-indulgence. The true gospel is about self-denial. I want us to look at this, softening of sin. All of the faith preachers soften, soften sin. Watch this from Todd White. God thought that you were worth it. The blood of Jesus is the price that he paid, and the price that God paid always determines the value of you. If the value of something is determined by the price that was paid, and the blood of Jesus was shed for you, and God thought that highly of each individual that God shed his own son's blood, and the value system of heaven is the price that was paid, how much more valuable are you than you think? So basically, and this has been a new thing with Todd White in the last couple of years, and he preaches on it often, uh, you are just so valuable. You're just so spanky. God just could not imagine having heaven without you. And so God just went bankrupt to get you back because, he, you know, you, 
God has a man-shaped hole in his heart, and he just, you know, you're all that in a bag of chips. The Bible says there is none who understands, there is none who seeks for God. All have turned aside. Together they have become what? Worthless. Worthless. Dear friends, God did not save us because we are great. He saved us because He is great. And He put His mercy on display in the gospel of Jesus Christ. We deserve nothing of His mercy. We deserve nothing but wrath. But God in His great mercy chooses to save. This from Rick Warren. Rick Warren said this. He said, for me, hell would be if God showed me all he could have done through my life and all the blessing I could have known if I had just trusted him a little bit more. That's what hell is to Rick Warren. It does not matter what Rick Warren thinks hell is. It doesn't matter what you or I think hell is. The only thing that matters is what does the Bible say about hell. And the Bible says that hell is a very real place where the worm will not die, the fire will not be quenched, where the full undiluted fury of God's wrath will be poured out for all of eternity. That's what hell is. But for Rick Warren, he says, for me, for me. That's, that's the problem, for me. It doesn't matter what you or I think. What matters is, is what does the Bible say? Watch this from J.D. Greer and Ed Litton. J.D. Greer and Ed Litton are both Southern Baptist pastors, both of them recent presidents of the Southern Baptist Convention, and they're preaching on homosexuality. Now, this clip from J.D. Greer is from a sermon that he preached on homosexuality in 2019. Ed Litton is from a sermon on homosexuality that he preached almost to the day one year later in 2020. Watch. Jen Wilkin, who's one of our favorite Bible teachers here and who's actually leading our women's conference, she said, she said, we ought to whisper about what the Bible whispers about, and we ought to shout about what it shouts about. And the Bible appears more to whisper when it comes to sexual sin compared to its shouts about materialism and religious pride. In the Bible, sexual sin is whispered compared to the shout God makes about greed and judgmentalism. So they say the Bible whispers about sexual sin, but it shouts about greed and pride. Really? Well, my Bible says that sexual sin is not to even be named among you. It's not to even be named among God's people. And dear friends, sin is sin is sin is sin. In all sins are equal in the sense that. All sin is transgression of the law of God, and all sin will incur his righteous wrath. That is true, but different sins do have different consequences, and far from whispering about sexual sin, the Bible actually singles out sexual sin as particularly injurious to us, because unlike other sins that are committed outside of the body, sexual sin is within the body, and it's different. It's different. There's an inherent difference in sexual sin than if, say, I go and, you know, rob a bank. Sexual sin is different. It's committed within the body. And there is, please hear me, God expends no more anthropomorphic energy saving us from sexual sin than he does from saving us from lying or being a thief or whatever. It takes no more energy for God to save us from sexual sin than any other sin. But sexual sin does leave a wound. It leaves a scar because it's committed inside the body, not outside of the body. And it's particularly injurious to us. Ask the residents of Sodom and Gomorrah as fire and brimstone was raining down upon them from heaven if that sounded like a whisper to them. Dear friends, the Bible does not whisper about any sin, much less sexual sin. Assuming it's hard for LGBTQ people to get to heaven. Where do we go wrong thinking LGBT people can't go to heaven? Homosexuality does not send you to hell. You know how I know that? 
Because heterosexuality does not send you to heaven. Homosexuality does not send people to hell. How do I know that? Because heterosexuality doesn't send people to heaven. Aside from the plagiarism, <laughs> to make that statement, homosexuality does not send you to hell. How do I know that? Heterosexuality does not send you to heaven. That is a mind-numbingly dumb thing to say. <laughs> Homosexuality absolutely does send people to hell. What Bible are these guys reading? Paul says, 1 Corinthians chapter 6, Do not be deceived. Neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor effeminate, nor homosexuals, nor revilers, covetous swindlers, will inherit the kingdom of God. Homosexuality absolutely will send you to hell. Now, it's not the only sin that will send you to hell, but it will send you there. If you die in homosexuality, if you die in that sin, you will not inherit the kingdom of God. Do not be deceived. But it is not the unforgivable sin. Because then Paul continues in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 11, and he says, For such were some of you. You were those things. You were a reviler, but you're not anymore. You were an idolater, but you're not anymore. You were a homosexual, but you're not anymore. But you were washed. You were sanctified. You were justified. Homosexuality will send someone to hell. But there is freedom in the gospel. You can be delivered from that sin. Fully and completely. And I show you these clips from Southern Baptists because this softening of sin is not unique to the charismatic movement. Southern Baptists do it too. Lots of evangelicals soften sin. I want us now to look at the word faith movement in their view of the sovereignty of God. They have a very low view of God's sovereignty. Watch this from Benny Hinn and Miles Monroe. Pastor, we get the mind of God about His will. We pray it. When we pray it, we give Him legal right to perform it. Yes. Let me Can define prayer for you in this show. Prayer is man giving God permission or license to interfere in earth's affairs. In other words, prayer is earthly license for heavenly interference. That's incredible. <laughs> that is incredible. God could do nothing on earth, nothing has God ever done on earth without a human giving him access. So he's always looking for that somebody. Always looking for a human to give him power, permission. In other words, God has the power, but you get the permission. God got the authority and the power, but you got the license. So even though God could do anything, He can only do what you permit Him to do. God can only do what we permit Him to do. Dear friends, I would submit to you this morning that God can do whatever He jolly well wants to do <laughs> and is not terribly concerned about whether or not He has our permission to do it. Watch this from Andrew Womack. But you know what? When you ask a question, and I know that many people have said this, maybe in these exact words or possibly you've rephrased it, but you've said, why does God let things like this happen? You know, when you say something like that, that shows that you are making an assumption that God could just control things if he wanted to. <laughs> that God could stop this. And you know what? That is an absolutely wrong assumption. And I can guarantee you with a lot of the religious doctrine that we have, especially the sovereignty of God teaching, there are going to be people all over the world that are just shocked that I would say something like that because they believe that, of course, God can do anything He wants to. That is not true. People believe that God can do anything He wants to. That is not true. Really? Huh. Well, 
My Bible says our God is in the heavens. He does whatever he pleases. I actually showed that verse uh, one time to a Word of Faith proponent. And, and he, he looked at it and he said, that just means that God can do whatever he wants to do in heaven, not on earth. You see, if he wants to do something on earth, then he has to have our permission. Whatever the Lord pleases, he does in heaven and in earth, in the seas and in all the deeps. Oops. Friends, God can do whatever he wants to do and is not losing a great deal of anthropomorphic sleep over whether or not he has our permission to do it. And I did show him that, and he just, he just walked away. <laughs> I want us to look at the uh, Christology of the word faith movement. If we can establish that they preach a different Jesus, we can establish that they do indeed preach a different gospel. The Christology of the word faith movement is a weird blend of these two different heresies, Arianism and adoptionism. Arianism was a denial of the deity of Christ. It believed that Jesus was himself a created being, just like Mormons and Jehovah's Witnesses believe today that Jesus was created. Adoptionism was a heresy of the late second century, which believed that Jesus was just a pious, humble man. And uh, God came upon Jesus and adopted him as his son at his baptism, and that's when Jesus began to work miracles. And, and the word faith Christology is a weird blending of these two different heresies. This from Creflo Dollar. Creflo Dollar says this. And somebody said, well, Jesus came as God. Well, how many of you know the Bible says God never sleeps nor slumbers? And yet in the book of Mark, we see Jesus asleep in the back of the boat. Jesus came as a man. And at age 30, God is now getting ready to demonstrate to us and give us an example of what a man with the anointing can do. Y'all, please listen to me. Please listen to me. This ain't no heresy. I'm not some false prophet. <laughs> Dear friends, as a general rule of thumb, if a preacher actually has to tell you that he's not a false prophet, chances are, chances are. So Creflo Dollar says that because Jesus was asleep in the boat and God never sleeps nor slumbers and therefore Jesus could not have been God. That is ridiculous. Dear friends, when Jesus came to this earth, Jesus, the Son of God, has always existed from eternity past. Not only was he not created, he was the creator. And in his incarnation, he took on a robe of human flesh and so Jesus was this one person with two distinct natures. Fully God, fully man. Truly God, truly man. One person, two natures. And as the God-man, Jesus experienced the same things that you and I experience. He got hungry. He got thirsty. Guess what? He got sleepy. It does not mean that he was not God. It was ridiculous. This from uh, Kenneth Hagin. He says, Every man who has been born again is an incarnation, and Christianity is a miracle. The believer is as much an incarnation as was Jesus of Nazareth. So if you are a Christian, you are just as much an incarnation as was Christ. Absolutely unbelievable. Now watch this video clip. This is, um, this is from the Las Vegas International Christian Church pastored, pastored by Denise Goulet. Again, if you have a female pastor, you've got neither a pastor nor do you have a church. But on this particular Sunday morning, Las Vegas International Christian Church, very poorly named, it should be Las Vegas International Goat Farm <laughs> because it's not a church. But they had a very special guest on this particular Sunday morning, none other than the President of the United States, Donald Trump. Now, this is not a knock on Trump. Uh, this is not, not saying anything about Trump politically. But Trump is no theologian, okay? Donald Trump is no theologian. And he's not a Christian. He's not a Christian. This is a man, don't get mad at me, but he is, this is a man who has said twice 
that he is, does not, has never asked God for forgiveness. Doesn't believe he has anything to ask for forgiveness for. Okay, by definition, if you say that, you ain't a Christian. All right? So this is not a knock on Trump. I want you to watch what Pastor Denise Goulet says about Donald Trump. What I was hearing the Lord say was, this is my son with whom I'm well pleased. Can you believe that? This is my son in whom I am well pleased. She said that about Trump. Not only did she say that, she claims that God told her that. It is a testimony to the patience and forbearance of God that the entire building did not collapse and kill every person in there. Unbelievable. Absolutely unbelievable. Um, watch this from Seth Dahl. Now this is a man, you may not know the name, but he is uh, or at least at the time of this recording, was a staff pastor at Bethel Church, Redding, California. Watch this from Seth Dahl. Now, let me say this before it plays. You're going to notice that this clip is going to begin with the Bethel logo and the music, and I point that out for this purpose. What you're about to see is not something that accidentally slipped past the editors and you know they get, it got out there and like oh man I wish we had caught that and cut this out no what you're about to see they're using in their advertising what you're about to see they're proud of watch I had a, I had a pastor say some things that hurt me really bad hurt me so bad, messed me up, emotionally, mentally, really messed me up. Nothing physical, nothing like that. A, a, a pastor I, I really respected said some words and hurt me so bad. And one time I was laying on the floor, actually it was in this room, I'm laying on the floor and in, an, in a vision, in an encounter with God, in a vision, Jesus picks me up and holds me so close that I can't see anything. And he holds me so close. And Jesus starts to weep. And he says, please forgive me. Please forgive me. I said, what are you talking about? Please forgive you. He said, when that pastor hurt you, it's as if I hurt you. Because he's a member of my body. Please forgive me. Sometimes... Blasphemy just almost isn't strong enough a word. The very notion that the second person of the triune God, the thrice holy, spotless Son of God, would come down to a sinful, vile creature and ask that thing for forgiveness? Blasphemy. Blasphemy. Your friends, I'm going to say something, and it may sound harsh, but I mean it. These people are not Christians. Oh, oh, wait, Justin, you're, you're saying they're not even saved? That's exactly what I'm saying. That is exactly what I'm saying. You cannot be indwelt by the Holy Spirit of God and teach these things. One of the great ironies in this movement is that people in the Word of Faith, NAR movement, they would look at me, and I would assume most of us, if not all of us in here, uh, who are cessationists. And we'll talk more about that in the next session. But as a cessationist, I believe not that all of the spiritual gifts have ceased, but only the apostolic, the sign gifts have ceased, the revelatory gifts have ceased. 
But as a cessationist, I believe that the gift of teaching, mercy, administration, those gifts are very much operative in the church today. Only the sign gifts, tongues, interpretation of tongues, physical healing, those gifts have ceased. But they would look at someone like me, and most if not all of us, and they would say, oh, you don't believe in the Holy Spirit. You don't believe in the power of the Holy Spirit. On contraire, as a cessationist, I cede no ground in my pneumatology to the charismatics. I cede no ground in my doctrine of the Holy Spirit of God to the charismatics. Because as a cessationist, I do not believe that you can be indwelt by the Holy Spirit of God and teach the blasphemies they teach, offer the false prophecies they offer, exploit the poor and the sick and the widows for personal financial gain, the way these people do, and be indwelt by the Holy Spirit of God and feel no conviction about it. I don't believe that's possible. My view of the Holy Spirit is far too high for that. You wouldn't have to be saved more than about five minutes, five seconds, to know that that's heresy. And yet they continue to teach these things year after year after year, decade after decade after decade. They've been called to repent, and yet there is none. There is none. Why isn't there any repentance? Because they're not indwelt by the Holy Spirit. If they were truly indwelt by the Holy Spirit, the first time they uttered one of these blasphemies, the Holy Spirit of God would drop them to their knees under such heavy conviction. And yet they don't. The Holy Spirit of God is not a weakling. He's not a girly man. If the Holy Spirit of God is strong enough to save us, He is also strong enough to deliver us out of deception. So as cessationists, dear friends, we should see no ground in our pneumatology, in our doctrine of the Holy Spirit to the charismatics. It is not we who have a low view of the Holy Spirit of God. It's they who have a low view of the Holy Spirit of God. Lest you think that Bethel Church is not a cult, I want to show you some clips from one of their baptismal services. This particular one was in 2019. Now, Bethel Church, Bethel Goat Farm, does their baptisms on Sunday nights. Not every Sunday night, but one or two Sunday nights a month. And they have all their baptismal candidates come up to the front, and the Bethel pastor, whoever's on duty that night, will uh, go up to each person with a microphone, and he asks the person two questions. First question, what is your name? Second question, why do you want to be baptized? And I want to show you three clips from just one baptismal service. And then we'll talk about them and decide whether or not these are true conversions. You tell me what you think. Watch this. One of the great privileges of being on staff here is that we get to baptize people. I'm going to ask a couple of questions, and then we're going to go ahead and begin to baptize people tonight. Well, two of those questions is one is your name, and the second of all is why you're being baptized tonight. And so let's start with you. What, what was your name and, and uh, why are you wanting to be baptized tonight? <laughs> My name's Michaela. <laughs> and, and, and why are you wanting to be baptized? Oh, it's Jesus is King. <laughs> I love him so much and I'm a child of God. <laughs> come, on, it's, come on, give her a round of applause, eh, man. That's... Do you think she has any idea what she's doing? No. It's a joke to her. She's, you know, she's laughing and she's acting like she's drunk, like she's intoxicated. Now, I don't think, I don't think she's really drunk. That's just their thing of being drunk in the spirit. You know, the Holy Spirit is just so strong on them that they lose all control of their bodies, never mind that one of the fruits of the spirit is actually self-control. But uh, she has no idea what she's doing. She has no idea what baptism is. No understanding of the gospel. That's not a testimony. Well, it gets worse. 
Would you come forward? What was your name? And tell us why you're being baptized tonight. My name is Camille, and I hope that tonight's bas baptism excuse me, will cause some positive influences in my life, positive things in my life, future opportunities, and strengthen my relationship with God. Camille, that's amazing. Thank you. I call this the good vibrations baptism because <laughs> she wants to get baptized because she hopes it will cause some positive things in her life. Do you think she has any idea what she's doing? Not a clue. Not a clue. No understanding of baptism. No understanding of the gospel. It gets worse. Because after she walked off the stage, this young lady walked up. Friend, why don't you come over? Tell us your name and tell us why you're being baptized tonight. Hi, I'm Crystal. And... <laughs> I just know that God is calling me to be a warrior for his animal kingdom and that I'm to lead angels of our, an army of angels to protect animals across the world. And I just know I can't do it without God. Come on, give Christoph a round of applause. That's amazing, sweet. Do what? She wants to be baptized because she wants to lead an army, an, ar an army of angels and be a warrior for the animal kingdom? <laughs> Hakuna Matata. <laughs> Do you think she has any idea of what she's, not the first clue, but they baptized her. They baptized her. And now these people, and friends, I could show you hundreds of clips from Bethel Baptismal Service. I've watched hundreds of them. I can honestly tell you, I have never heard a single person give something that would even pass a first grade vacation Bible school testimony. But they baptized them. And now all of these untold numbers, thousands of people that they baptized, thousands. They think they're Christians. And yet they don't have the faintest idea of what the gospel is. What you're looking at right there is some of the bad fruit that comes from the pulpit of Bethel Church. What you see right there, that is, that's one day that's going to be laid at the feet of Bill Johnson. That is a cult. And yet, and yet, our churches are absolutely full of Bethel music and Hillsong music. Lest you think Hillsong isn't as bad as Bethel is, oh, it is. In fact, Brian Houston, of the head of Hillsong and Bill Johnson, Bethel Church, they're friends. They endorse each other. They speak at each other's churches. And even churches in our reform circles who have a high view of the sovereignty of God, who profess to have a high view of Scripture, even our churches are singing Bethel music in singing Hillsong music on Sunday morning. That is appalling. That is appalling. And the argument is, well, it's, you know, some of their songs, yeah, they're bad churches, but some of their songs have good lyrics. And, you know, yeah, some of their songs, not all of them, some, a lot of their songs are like Jesus is my boyfriend kind of songs. But some of their songs, to be fair, yeah, their, their, li their lyrics would pass a basic doctrinal smell test. And the argument is, well, as long as the lyrics are okay, let's, let's sing it. No. No, 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 a thousand times no. Because they use their music as a hook to pull people in to their cult. And Bill Johnson will tell you that. Brian Houston will tell you that. That is their primary means of their own twisted form of evangelism, is their music, to pull people into their cult. 
And so people sitting out in the pew on a typical church on a Sunday morning, maybe there's a church that's not even word of faith, not prosperity gospel at all, but they're in the pew and they look up on the screen on Sunday morning and they see these lyrics and then the fine print, what do they see? Music by Bethel. Music by Hillsong. Oh, Bethel, Hillsong. They must be okay. I mean, after all, we're singing their music. They must be okay. I think I'll check them out. That's how they bring people into their cult. And I'll take it a step further. If a church is doing what it should be doing, according to the CCLI licensing agreements, when you sing copyrighted music in your church on Sunday morning, then you should be sending in a fee, money, to the CCLI organization, which then distributes that money to whoever writes the music. So if a church is doing what it should be doing, you're sending money that is in turn, when you sing Bethel and Hillsong, that money filters its way to Bethel, to Hillsong. You are funding a cult. You're funding a cult. I've given this illustration before and it's gotten me in some hot water, but I'll stand by it because I believe it. Um, let me illustrate how serious this is. Let's say for whatever reason, obviously this would never happen, but let's just say uh, Planned Parenthood. We all hate Planned Parenthood, right? We should. It's an organization that murders children. Horrible. It's an American Nazis. Let's say Planned Parenthood has a board meeting and they come up, you know, they have a board meeting and they say, you know, we need, to, we need to do something to bring some more money into our coffers so we can murder more children. I know what we can do. Let's write some Christian music. And let's make those lyrics pass a basic doctrinal smell test so the Christians will sing it in their churches. And when they do that, of course, they have to send us money because we'll have it copyrighted. So they write some music. Now, let me ask you, if you were sitting in a church and the lyrics of the song come up on the screen, and good lyrics, good music, you know, well done, professional. But then you happen to notice in the fine print, music by Planned Parenthood. What? Would you stand for it? No. Rightly so. I don't care how good the lyrics are, if it's coming from Planned Parenthood, I'm not going to worship God with that. I would submit to you that as horrible as that is, and I take a back seat to no one in my disdain for Planned Parenthood, abortion is murder. Full stop. Abortion is murder. But if there's anything worse than sending money to Planned Parenthood, it would be sending money to a cult. Planned Parenthood is, it's a lost organization. They're not Christians. Lost people act like lost people. They can do nothing else. Christians, though, they're supposed to be different. Bethel and Hillsong claim to be Christian churches. And if there's anything worse than what Planned Parenthood does, it is professing Christians preaching a different Jesus, preaching a different gospel, and leading millions upon millions of people straight down the primrose path to hell. If there's anything worse, it's that. Worship is for God. We are to worship Him in spirit and in truth. And we cannot worship him with music that comes from a cult that preaches a different Jesus. So, dear friends, these are not minor theological differences. We're not talking here about who wrote the book of Hebrews or when was the date of the Exodus or you pre mill or a mill or, you know, we're, these, are, these are not secondary issues. These issues go to the heart of the gospel. Hope this has been helpful for you, dear ones. Um, just a bird's eye view at the origins and the doctrines of the Word of Faith movement. So let us take a break now, right? Uh, we'll reconvene it.